Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we glorify you today through our remembrance of the ascension. And we thank you, dear Lord, for your acts of kindness and mercy in showing us the way of truth. Dear Lord, help empower us to continue your mission on this earth, to transform every heart into a heart of love and mercy and understanding and belief in the one true God. Amen. You know, throughout Hebrew scripture, one can find a tradition observed by the founding prophets and patriarchs like Moses. And it is to deliver an address at the time of their dying. Typically in these addresses, they bid farewell to their loved ones, remind them of how God is present in their lives, and leave them with some words of wisdom about what the future might hold. This is a tradition that we've heard in recent times as well. Think of the last lecture by Randy Posh, or Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Elbow. Both come to mind as serving a similar purpose, passing down wisdom, lessons, and parting words. Serves an important function in the continuity of the human race from generation to generation. Now, in the passage from John we read this morning, Jesus is heard following in the tradition of the prophets that came before. We overhear Jesus parting words in the form of a prayer, and it is a very tender moment. Jesus is praying for his disciples. The depth of his feeling and his concern for them is very touching. This prayer is part of a longer discourse in which Jesus first prays for himself, then for his disciples, and then for future believers. These words of Jesus were uttered at a time when his death was imminent. These are the words prayed when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now I admit it can be confusing to hear this passage in the church today, Because up to now, during the Easter season, we've been celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and hearing gospel passages that tell of his struggles of his disciples to accept what happened, to understand it in the context of their lives and to move on. Through much of this time, they remained huddled in an upper room, fearful of the world. To further confound the sudden shift in our readings, We all know last Thursday, the church commemorated the Feast of the Ascension. So you may ask, why did the architects of our lectionary choose to place this specific reading at this time? Why go back to an encounter that occurred prior to the Ascension, prior to the Resurrection, and even before the Crucifixion? Well, my guess is they did so to set the stage for the great feast of Pentecost, which we'll be celebrating next Sunday. The scriptural accounts of the Ascension also provide us with a clue. Rather than spending much time focusing on the wonder of this mystical event, the passages from Mark, Luke, Acts, Matthew pay more attention to Jesus' instructions to his followers. So let's look at that. What do we hear in this prayer of Jesus? We hear of Christ's hopes for his followers and the church. Hopes that will begin to break forth beyond the upper room upon the occasion of Pentecost. Jesus speaks in his prayer about the mission of his church. Now just as a business or other organization periodically goes back to their mission statement to evaluate if the course they are on is stays true to their mission, so we too, the church, can find it helpful to do so as well. So let's look at what Jesus is pointing us toward in this passage. After a brief prayer for personal strength, Jesus prayers, prays for his disciples. He affirms that he has passed down knowledge to them and fervently prays that they will recognize that all that is well and good and beautiful within them comes from God the Father. 
Irenaeus, the first bishop of Lyon in France, captured the fullness of this prayer when he wrote at the end of the second century, quote, the glory of God is in the human person fully alive. The glory of God is in the human person fully alive. This gift, gift from God resides in all of us. It is a gift that energizes our work to carry forth the good news. In his prayer, Jesus draws attention to the message he has tried to teach throughout his ministry. We are created in goodness. And he has taught us how we are to live a life of goodness. Henceforth, we are to use our talents to further God's mission of compassion, peace, and justice in the world as we prepare ourselves for life in the next. Jesus' ministry itself equipped us with what we need to do to carry out the mission of the church. But, and it's a big but, it is not all up to him. This is to be a partnership. There is a task left up to us. And the task is for us to consciously embrace the knowledge that all which is good, all which is beautiful, comes from one source, God. To do so takes a humble attitude on our part. It takes a taming of our ego, that part of ourselves that wants to name our talents and accomplishments as being something only of the self. God's kingdom is not defined by the self, but by a mutual relationship, an intimate communion between God and humankind and humankind with each other. And this union is actualized each time we welcome God into our hearts. You may ask, how do we do this? Well, for starters, we need to create space for God. We need to empty ourselves of the darkness within, let go of our obsession with ourselves, tear down the walls that separates us from each other and from God. It always comes down to a choice, a choice that is the burden of being human. We must consciously choose the path of goodness over evil. In this prayer, Jesus prayed that we would be strengthened in our ability to make that right decision in our life. His hope is that the disciples may experience the unity he shares with his Father, that they may share in his joy, and that they will be consecrated in truth. He prays for the truth which will be bestowed on them through the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. The same blessing that is actualized for us at baptism on an each occasion that we are blessed and dedicated to the goodness of God. In the coming days, on the Feast of the Pentecost, we remember the Holy Spirit becoming mystically alive in each of the apostles, empowering them to do the work of the Lord. Going back to this prayer at Gethsemane, Jesus prayed that his followers, and that includes us today, might have an intimate relationship with God and one another. In a part of his prayer, which appears a few lines beyond the passage we heard this morning, Jesus prayed that in the future, quite, they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, they may also be in us, so that the world may believe you have sent me. Jesus prayed that we might be empowered just like the apostles to do the work of God. He prayed that we all experience, quote, a turning to him, a conversion that leads to mystical unity with God and with one another. Finally, Jesus prayed that we might be upheld by God's protective love as we make our way through the world. He knew of the dangers the evil, the hard choices of human life. We may feel disappointment with life. We may feel betrayed at the hands of friends and leaders, but rest assured, God will never betray us. God loves us unconditionally. The former Archbishop of South Africa, Desmond Tutu, put it like this, quote, God's gaze is like the gaze between lovers wrapped in a tender embrace. 
God looks at us the way a mother looks lovingly at her newborn baby. If you can see the loving gaze between mother and child in your mind's eye, you can begin a small meditation on being held in God's loving gaze. Once you are able to fix the gaze in your mind, put yourself in the sight line of the one gazing. Allow yourself to be the subject of that long loving look. In this way you can imagine, then experience, the loving gaze God turns toward us. As we allow ourselves to accept God's acceptance, we begin to accept our own goodness and beauty. With each glimpse of our own beauty, we can begin to see the goodness and beauty in others. To me, the most amazing thing about Jesus' prayer is that he prays for us at all. This was a time he was surely beset with great anxiety and fear of what lay ahead. And in spite of this time of trial, Jesus did not think only about himself and his troubles. His concern was about his friends and followers, a powerful lesson for us in life. Only a small part of the prayer was for himself. The vast majority of it was for the welfare of his followers in the world. You have to admit, what an incredible act of love. We should all remember his example next time we are beset by troubles. And my friends, we can rejoice today that Jesus' prayer at Gethsemane has been answered. We have a God who loves us, a Redeemer who prays for us, and we have one another to support us. So let us this day and every day go forth rejoicing to love and serve the Lord. Amen.